Good morning, my dear brothers and sisters in the Lord. Good morning, Church of the Living God. I'm Jambo. The Lord is good. And all the time. And that is nature. I want to thank the Lord this morning and in this very Sabbath that he has given me a privilege that I could even stand before you and before our Lord and Savior and even to share this bread of life this morning in this particular church which is, in as far as my knowledge is concerned, maybe the biggest church in this place, and for such an honor, then this morning, I'm glad to say, glory be unto our Lord and Savior. I want to thank God for the church leadership, our senior pastor here and his team, for identifying me, even that other side of Rongai, where we have the Adventist University of Africa, and more precisely for my dear pastor here, Amayo Meshek. He did talk to one of our professors, Pastor David Odiambo, who said, my, my dear student, why can't you go and share this bread of life to the saints at uh, Nairobi Central Church? Pastor, may the Lord bless you and bless your family. Um, this morning, indeed, we are coming from that southern country of Malawi, together with my friend Watson. That's where we are actually working. He's working by the lakeside, Lake Malawi, and I'm pastoring in a city called Zomba, which is to the southern part, south, south and eastern part of Malawi. That's where I'm actually working as a district pastor. This morning, I want, before, I want us, before we begin sharing God's message, to have this special experience, this special greeting. You may look onto your friend, you may even hold his or hand and say, Shabbat Shalom, and then your friend can always say, Shalom Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat. Can we try that one this morning? Since we are in these very holy hours of the Lord. Shabbat, Shalom, Shalom, Shabbat. Shabbat is peace, um, Sabbath. And then Shalom is peace. The greeting this morning is saying, I wish you another peaceful Sabbath. And then we are saying, may the, the Lord who gives peace even be with you in these very hours of the Sabbath. Our message this morning, as we have been sharing, is entitled, When God Says Run. We will look precisely on a single text this morning. And that is coming from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Shall we pray? Our kind and gracious Father who art in heaven, from everlasting to everlasting, from generation to another generation, you have been a great God, a marvelous God, a wonderful God. May Father, in thine own way, you come and worship with us, speak to us, and even uplift our hearts, our souls, unto you in Jesus' name. Amen. This is what the Bible is saying to us this morning. It's a question. Do you not know that in a race, all, are, all the runners run? And they do this to their very best to win. But only one person, one competitor, one in a race, receives the prize. 
Therefore Paul is saying, run your race in such a way that you may seize the prize and make it yours. My dear brothers and sisters this morning, our focus in this morning sharing, in this message, is coming to us from a place called Corinth. Corinth was a city that was founded in and around 550 BC. It's a peninsula, it's on an island, and it's a place where all the retired servicemen under the Roman Empire would go and, uh, and see, would go and settle. They would secure, they'd procure plots and make their, uh, and make their homes and enjoy life after week. Corinth as a city had a, one of the biggest markets in the then Roman Empire called the Agora. Corinth indeed was a city that was so famous because it, was, it had only one factory that was known for grass or mirror making. That's why we all read as he, in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 2, now we see but dim reflection as in a mirror. Corinth indeed had one factory that was very known for making mirrors and glass. Corinth was a very religious city. That's why as we read in this book, we find Paul the Apostle writing that I have but moved in all the highways, in the streets, on the roads, and I'm always being challenged by the signposts that are written to the known God. Indeed, Corinth was filled with people who were but very religious. Ironically, Corinth had one of the biggest temples in the then Roman uh, Empire or history. It was a temple of Apollo, where inside of it there was goddess of love by the name of Aphrodite. And inside this temple where there was goddess of love, it used to habit over 1,000 harrods, 1,000 prostitutes. And I'm told these days, we don't know, we no longer call them prostitutes. We no longer call them harrods. There's a better terminology. They are called Resha consultants. Resha consultants. Resha consultants. So every evening, my dear brothers and sisters, every evening there was a bell that would be rung in this temple. And as these prostitutes, as these Resha consultants are descending onto the city, they would be singing only one slogan, play Corinth. And when this slogan is being played, that means every other man, every other young man or old man would be grabbed for business. Indeed, these were leisure consultants in the city of Corinth. My dear brothers and sisters, this morning, as if you want to talk of a church in Corinth, it was founded, where Paul is writing to us this morning, it was founded, the church in Corinth was founded by a missionary couple by the name of Aquila and Priscilla around the years 51 and 52 AD. Paul as an apostle, Paul as a church planter, he was requested, it is said that Aquila and Priscilla came all the way from Rome to establish a small church by the peninsula of Corinth. They were actually by profession, they were tent makers. Even Paul was also a tent maker. So they joined their ventures. They joined the initiative of planting Christian churches along the seas, along the waters in the then Roman Empire. So they invited Paul to come and to encourage the brothers and the sisters at Corinth. So on request by this couple, 
Paul visited this congregation two years later. But the moment the church was established, it didn't take long, my dear brothers and sisters in this place. Soon, doctrinal and cultural challenges rocked this small, growing church at Corinth. Remember this morning, we are sharing on a simple message, when God says, run. There were issues to do with spiritual immaturity, issues to do with instability, divisions. The church was actually divided. Some would be saying, I'm of Apollos. Some would be saying, I'm of Aquila and Priscilla. Some would be saying, I'm of Cephas, Peter. Some would be saying, yes, I'm so and so. So the church got divided. So Jairus came in, Envy came in, lawsuits came in, marital difficulties came in, sexual immorality came in, and the misuse of spiritual gifts also came in, in this church of Cor at Corinth. Evidently, or eventually, Paul was concerted. The brethren they said, so why, why don't we write Paul? So that he may help us to, to understand and how best we may deal with the issues that are but surrounding our spiritual warfare in this church at Corinth. When God says run. My dear brothers and sisters this morning, Paul's counsel now, he's now responding to the issues which the brethren have written to him, to Paul, and then he's giving and this counsel is saying, my dear brothers and sisters, don't you know that in a race, people run, very many, and only one person actually wins. So there is no reason for you to think of anything else than to think of what will be happening to the brethren that would gather at a certain place called Mount Olympus. Olympus. Paul is saying this morning, he's saying, run your race in such a way that you may seize the prize and make it yours. My dear brothers and sisters this morning, indeed there was a place in Corinth known by the name Mount Olympus where winners, after they have competed, they have, they have, they have finished their, their competition, Winners were awarded only bush flowers and pine tree branches. Unlike today, as we'd see in this picture, this is late Kevin Kiptum. Unlike today, when somebody has won, he or she is given gold medals, silver medals. But in those days, when somebody has become number one, what he would be given were only two things. Bush flowers, as well as pine tree branches. Which, in other words, these are perishables. They don't stay long. If somebody receives them this morning, at this moment, by noon time or by evening time, they have already withered. My dear brothers and sisters, this morning, who is challenging us to say, in this missionary race, where you and me are part of, in this journey of life, God has prepared for us an everlasting price, and this is the gift of life. Paul is challenging us this morning that unlike in the days of Corinth, but to us as Christians, to us as Adventists, to us as members of this church, we should know that God has prepared something big something everlasting, something which is not perishable, and this is the gift of the everlasting life in Jesus' name. Therefore, Paul is saying this morning, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters here at Nairobi Central Church, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence and without fear so that we may receive mercy for our failures and even to find the grace to help us in times of need, and coming just at the right moment. God is waiting to give me, to give unto us this everlasting gift, because we are victors in Jesus' name. We are conquerors 
in Jesus' name. Ellen White has this to say in her book, Testimonies, Volume 9, um, page number 10, paragraph 3. This is what Ellen White is saying. She say, we have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us. Except as we shall forget his teaching in past history. Yes, our histories may be crooked, may be hopeless, may be help hopeless. But at this moment, when the Lord has called us even unto this church, we should know for sure that the Lord has prepared for you. The Lord has prepared for me a very wonderful gift. And this is the gift of the everlasting life in Jesus' name. Oh, he's saying to us, indeed, as Adventist Church, we are moving forward. We are marching to Zion, slowly but surely, but we are moving to the beautiful city of Zion. Soon and very soon, we shall all sing this redemption song because Jesus has already defeated us and has already become our conqueror, uh, the conqueror on our behalf. The Lord is saying to us this morning, we have a sure destination. We are going to heaven very soon. We are marching. We are moving. We are running to the third heaven. You know, the Bible has this to say that heaven is categorized in three, in, 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 in three areas. There is the first heaven, we, which, which we have the firmament. I mean, where, where we have these birds flying. This is the first heaven. Now there is the second heaven where we have the moon, the stars, the planets, this is called the starry heaven. But then you and me, a sense of the living God, we are moving to the very third heaven where our God dwells and where God has gone to prepare for us a place. The Bible has this to say, let us therefore run, run and run towards our place, our, towards our place with no fear but love. It may be this morning that we have come to congregate worship in this place. But yet, if you look, our, our, if we look back, it's like maybe we have stagnated. Why have we stagnated? It could be like this, that we have come in this place, and yet we don't have anyone to call a friend. But I want to announce this morning that even though we may not have friends in this place, I want to say, and gladly say, that we have a friend by the name of Jesus Christ, who loves us, who visits us in our moments, when we are at our lowest lows, his name is Emmanuel, who is more than a brother to us, who would be by us whether we are at the highest moments of our lives, whether we have food, we don't have food in our homes, whether we have water, we don't have water in the homes, but Jesus is a very trusted friend. Indeed, we may be struggling with life, becoming helpless and hopeless, no food, no water, no appetite, even no, nobody to call a fancy. I want to challenge us this morning that we have a friend, we have a brother who loves us, and his name is indeed God with us. He is the blessed hope of glory. We may be experiencing broken relationships in our homes, in our workplaces, in our schools, but I want, I want to now see this morning that indeed, we, our families may be tattering apart. We may be separating emotionally. We may be separating physically. But I want to challenge us this morning that even though we may have stubborn children in our very homes, stubborn supervisors in our workplaces, stubborn teachers in our schools, but I want to announce this morning that indeed, we have a brother and a very loving brother and his name is once again the desire of ages. We must run, dear brothers and sisters. We must run so that we may receive the price which the Lord has prepared for us. This morning, the Lord is saying, in this race of life, we have only one competitor, the accuser of our, of, of our brethren. And this one is the devil himself. Paul is challenging the Corinthian church, the Corinthian church members, to stop being divided. They should not have divided homes because a divided home is a divided church. A happy home is a happy church. 
So Paul is challenging them to say, don't aspire for positions. These earthly positions are but temporal. They are temporal. We should, they should stop competing each other because of their spiritual gifts which they have freely given. They should stop neglecting the word of God. They should be running as they read the bread of life which is the Bible itself. Yes, in these times, we should stop neglecting prayer and fasting. We have no reason to stop neglecting prayer and fasting, but to exercise self-control. Let us then as men and women who always love the Lord come to him with all our hearts, our souls, our might, our wealth, our health, our dispositions to inherit the everlasting prize which is coming at the coming, at the advent of our Messiah, Jesus Christ himself. This is what Mark Finley wrote some time back. He says, we cannot expect a revival when our hearts are more inclined to television, comedians, than prayer. We cannot expect a revival when we are more interested in the morning sports pages than the morning devotions. We cannot expect a revival when our violation of the, health, the message of health reform has clogged our brains so that we cannot discern the voice of the Spirit. Indeed, we cannot, we cannot expect a revival when our minds are filled with his thoughts of fashion rather than thoughts of the spotless robe of Christ's righteousness. What do we say at the church this morning? Indeed, praise and honor be unto him forever and ever this morning. Indeed, this morning, Paul is challenging us when he's saying, please run. He said, he said, he said that in this missionary journey, all are involved and all are winners. Unlike the church at Corinth, unlike the city at Corinth, where only one person would emerge as a winner, but in this missionary journey, all of us are winners. All of us are involved. Because in those days, it's only one person or three or four who would receive these perishables. But in these days, and even in the life hereafter, God is saying, it's only not going to be given to one person, but each and every person, because Christ came for all of us yet to be saved. Yes, Aaron wants us to say that every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. He who drinks of the, of the living water becomes a fountain of life. The receiver indeed becomes a giver. We need to get involved in the mission of rescue the perishing because this is total member involvement. This is total member involvement. This morning... In this race of life, in this race of faith, victory is personally granted. And Paul is exclaiming to us this morning to say, yes, I need no other evidence. I need no plea. Because Jesus Christ came and died for me at the cross of Calvary. And he rose again. That me, who is yet but a sinner, may be saved. Me, who is rugged, who is full of ill intentions, ill motives, may dine with him who is but the spotless lamb of Calvary. Boys, explain to us, I need no evidence that Jesus came to die and even to die for me. You know, Ellen White wrote to say in the book of Steps to Christ that even though it was just one person who would sin or would have sinned, still Christ would come and die for him and die for her. Or he's saying, I have fought this good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous just, who award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who love his appearing. 
may we be among the saints. May we receive this crown of life. May we be among those who shall enter the gates singing this redemptive song that indeed the Lord has but redeemed us. Saints of the living God, let us run purposely, let us run prayerfully because there is a price which the Lord has prepared for us. When God says run, we must run. When heaven says run, we must run. And when this great missionary says run, we must all run because Christ has already experienced it. Paul is saying to us as I conclude this morning that indeed I have wandered far away from God, but now I'm coming home. The path of sin, too long I have trod. Lord, I'm coming home. Paul is challenging the, brother, the brethren at Corinth, please come home. Come home. Don't wander away. Don't go wayward. Come home because we are purposely in a race. Lord, I'm tired of running around. My life is empty with no meaning. Yes, I may be challenged even in keeping the Holy Sabbath. I may be challenged even in being a faithful steward. I may be challenged even to remain a faithful young man and young woman. Yes, I may be challenged with hatred, envy, jealous, and pride, and addictions, but Lord, I'm coming home. Yes, my path of sin that I have trod is long and destructive, but this morning, Lord, I'm coming home. Paul is pleading to the saints, to the church members, to the brothers and sisters at Corinth, Please come home. Please run in a race. Please come to him who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Indeed, we can all say this morning, yes, I'm coming home. As I conclude, I want to leave these words which one of the greater, greater founders of the great Methodist movement, Methodist Church said, by the name of John Wesley, he said, and I quote, I judge all things only by the price they shall gain in eternity. I judge all things only by the price they shall gain in eternity. My dear brothers and sisters, how are we running this morning? It is my singular prayer that the Lord, who called us from darkness, bringing us light into a marvelous light, should help us to run steadily, faithfully, trusting in the Lord, because Christ has already defeated our competitor, the accuser of the brethren, even at the cross of Calvary. May the Lord help us, and may the Lord bless us. May the Lord keep us, and may the Lord make his face shine upon us. Until then, we shall meet at the celestial show, even in his kingdom. To him and him alone be all the glory and honor, dominion and power in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.